another couple of weeks, another couple of episodes of Agatha all along. And let me tell you, I've learned more about the Agatha fan base than I have anything else over these past few videos. After my review of episode three, I received my most ratioed video ever. Why? Because Agatha All Along is a show I think is indicative of what is wrong in modern entertainment, but instead of getting angry like some reviewers, I make fun of it. Why? Because I'm a proud member of Generation X, and mocking things with acerbic sarcasm and pointed critical observation is one of our superpowers, and Agatha fans seem to take exception to that. But I also wanted to be fair, I never liked to sandbag people, so I made sure that either the thumbnail and or the title of the video was specific in advertising how my review of episode 3 would be. I called it the worst. But I guess that wasn't sufficient enough. So, okay, maybe people don't read the title. I can buy that. They just see Agatha and click, and they don't like what I have to say. Therefore, my reviews of episode four and five, I decided to add more to my video in the form of, for lack of a better term, a trigger warning. So before I launched into my review, I specifically stated that my review would mock the show, would be negative in its nature, and would probably upset you if you're a fan of the series. This I did in the first 30 seconds. I figured, okay, I get to speak my opinion, have a little fun making my post, but I also show some deference and compassion for those who are fans of the series, you know, like a compromise. Basically, Basically, I said, click off, don't watch, don't consume. It's okay not to partake or listen to my take if it brings you any psychological harm or emotional distress. I'm a firm believer in the freedom of choice, but I see now a certain segment of the population, mostly Agatha fans, are incapable of doing this. They're incapable of choosing for themselves because I got the same vitriol for that review as I did in my episode three review. What I found out is that most Agatha All Along fans are illogical or lack common sense, much like the show itself. They are intolerant of divisive opinion and differing perspectives, and for me, it's kind of funny to see these people pop off like this. These are the same kinds of people that if you told them that something tastes like dog shit, their immediate reaction is to take a giant bite and then blame you because they have shit stuck between their teeth now. I mean, I warned you. I told you what was going to happen. I told you how it was going to be. I offered you an out. You didn't take it. The button said do not press, and you pressed it. So, in short, I figured out this fan base is very fragile, very small, but still very fragile, and again, it's funny to me. So listen up, snowflakes, here's how it's supposed to work. I'll give you an example to help you out with how you cope with this kind of stuff. Joker 2 was almost universally hated, derided, mocked, and shit on over the past few weeks. However, if you've seen my review of that film, then you know that I love that movie. Call it a bad take, call it a bad review, call it whatever you want. I loved it. Just because a million other YouTube channels stomped it into the ground does not mean I can't enjoy that movie or should be embarrassed by my point of view. I make my video, they make theirs, life rolls on. And that's my suggestion to you. If your happy existence is predicated on your favorite TV show being globally accepted as fantastic, then some guy in Central America making reaction videos is the least of your problems. As Michael Jordan would say, Stop it. Get some help. Or just keep the comments coming. Either way, welcome to the world of free expression and greetings from south of the border. And with that, let's get into Agatha All Along episodes 6 and 7. When we last left Wiccan, or William, or Billy, or whatever you want to call him, because the big mystery of the show, who is teen, was never a mystery at all. We knew from episode 2 that this was Wiccan. For those of you who could not figure that out, episode 6 is the big mystery reveal. It's all about how William Kaplan became Wiccan. Yep, pretty much a giant episode of flashbacks telling us what we already knew, explaining to us things that we didn't care about to have explained to us in the first place, or just forgot about already. Apparently, William Kaplan, a nice young Jewish boy having his bar mitzvah and for some odd reason this bar mitzvah has a fortune teller as part of the festivities because palm readings and tarot cards are an integral part of the jewish faith i remember reading that when studying world religions at university anyway the fortune teller is our old lady witch and she discovers that william has a broken lifeline and sees that he will become wicked so she does the best thing for the young boy she hides the truth and places a sigil on him so he cannot reveal his true name to anyone now, apparently, this party and the surrounding area is right next to Westview during the events of WandaVision, and that town is still surrounded by the Anomaly. And this all makes sense, because there's no way the government would demand that surrounding populations evacuate the immediate areas bordering a large, mystical, unknown, possibly dangerous force. I mean, that would be silly. William and his family are driving home directly next to the large, unknown, mystical barrier that has caught the attention of federal response teams. And William's mother, who's driving, 
driving, becomes distracted. So she crashes, and William dies. Then, as the anomaly disappears, and here's where if you didn't do your homework and watched WandaVision, you wouldn't know that Wanda's two children from that series disappear at that same time because they are also figments of magic. But here, one of them doesn't want to go, so he enters William's body and takes over his dead shell. That's right, body snatching by the essence of a child that didn't really exist in the first place. I know, none of that made sense. Again, that's Agatha all along. So now Wiccan wakes up in the hospital. He's confused. Basically, he has amnesia and is in a new life and then learns to cope with it as he discovers he has the ability to read minds. Three years pass as Wiccan deceives everyone around him and preys on two parents who have actually lost their child in a horrific car wreck. But again, that's not something to worry about. Lying to two people while impersonating their dead son for personal gain is totally okay in this series. But Wiccan doesn't stop there with his victimization of other people. He and his boyfriend are then making out. He tells his boyfriend that he's not who he's claimed to be all this time. He's been catfishing this poor young man. And we find out he's also been reading his boyfriend's mind as well. Totally not a violation of privacy or creepy in any other way. But again, don't think too hard. This show doesn't either. And we kind of gloss over that whole thing. We next get the two of them going over all of Wiccan's research about the anomaly and its connection to magic. Wiccan reveals that he has a contact with someone who actually lived in Westview at the time of the anomaly and is now willing to talk to him about it. Enter Ralph Boner. Remember him from episodes 6, 7, and 8 of WandaVision? No? Well, don't worry, he recaps the whole WandaVision plot in five minutes, and then they get into the subject of Agatha Harkness and more exposition, but at least this scene is entertaining. Evan Peters can act, gotta give him that. I enjoyed this scene very much. Wiccan then goes home to listen to the Witch's Road song and to Google Agatha Harkness. That's right, he Googles her. So let's stop for a minute here. An ancient witch, a person who's suspected of multiple murders and linked to multiple tragedies, and is known by the authorities because if Wiccan can just Google her, I am sure the computers in the FBI crime lab can figure it out as well. This suspected threat to all humankind is just left in the town of Westview to be looked after by the citizens that she helped torture. Oh, and they made her a member of the police force. Okie dokie, it seems perfectly reasonable to me. Wanda is dead, Vision is dismantled, but Agatha Harkness, legendary and obviously well-documented witch, pictures and all, is given a picket fence house and a job where she carries a gun and a badge. Therefore, Wiccan does the only thing he can think to do, he breaks into her house to make her remember who she is, and therefore unleashing a terrifying threat to the well-being of everyone. Awesome plan. We then get 10 minutes of episode 1 from Wiccan's perspective, and his big name reveal, I am Billy Maximoff. Thanks, we already knew that. Welcome to the party. And just like that, back to the Witch's Road, where what happens is exactly what I said would happen. Agatha gets out of the sinking bog because there's no real tension or conflict in the show. Billy is now aware of who he is, and he and Agatha have a conversation. Agatha monologues for a bit about being bad and being good, and the episode ends with Wicking stating that he's not that nice. Well, we kind of got that after you stole a dead body, became a predator of two loving parents and a young gay man, and then murdered two women for no reason that is ever given. Seems like a modern-day Disney hero to me. And the episode ends with the two of them walking down the road, just a couple of misunderstood murdering parasites. Well, what did we learn? Teen is Wiccan. Oh, wait, we knew that. Wiccan is gay and has a boyfriend. Oh, wait, we knew that too. At least if you read the comics, you did. Let's see, what else? What else happened? Ralph Boner is alive. That's nice, but it really doesn't mean anything for the rest of the show. And, oh, I know, nothing. This episode is just like the others. If you did not watch it, you did not miss a thing. Let's see what episode seven has in store for us now. Wait, old lady witch and African-American witch are still alive? How could that be? I thought Wiccan murdered them. Oh yeah, like I said before, there are no real consequences or tension or conflict in this show. After we learn that, we get Agatha with the best line in the episode. If you want a straight answer, ask a straight lady. Okay, so all non-straight women are liars. I didn't know that. That's important life information to have. Gotcha. Then, because we've not used this plot device for two episodes, another house appears for the next trial. This time, Wiccan and Agatha enter, and they are changed into cosplay. Agatha is the Wicked Witch of the West, talk about blasphemy on a pop culture scale, and Wiccan is a cross-dressing Malfician, cheekbones and all, because all witches are queer according to the cast. I'll try to remember that when I visit my male friends in Salem, Massachusetts, next time I'm back in New England. I'm sure they will be surprised to know this. 
the trial this time, properly use a deck of tarot cards or a ceiling of swords rains down upon you. And no, there's no real danger here because in this episode, they actually dodge the swords as they fall. Now, because there's a time limit like all the other trials, the ceiling itself begins to lower. But again, Agatha and Wiccan are not dying here. We all know that. There's no real danger to our characters. Meanwhile, Old Lady Witch is suffering from time dilation because she keeps jumping back and forth in time and it's a mess. Back and forth, over and over, back and forth. And it lasts much of this episode. And whoever edited it must have had a meat grinder because it has the flow of being chopped up to the state of being annoying. Now, I won't even get into her story because it mostly involves her talking as a child to another old lady about reading tea leaves. Long story short, African-American witch and old lady witch get to the trial through tunnels that are under the road that apparently exist because there are no consequences to drowning in quicksand. Even the Salem Seven have made their way down there. How? Don't know. And for some reason, it looks like these tunnels are filled with hotel laundry carts. Anyway, Old Lady Witch is now dressed as a white witch after falling. And yes, I know, they ripped off Gandalf from Lord of the Rings for this scene. Just let it go, Tolkien fans. Just let it go. African American Witch is now dressed with long blonde braids. So I guess we can now call her Cultural Appropriation Witch? Their joke, not mine. Old Lady Witch reads Wiccan's tarot cards. There are multiple jokes about being gay. A trapdoor opens up in an Iron Maiden. They all escape, except for Old Lady Witch who stays behind. Why? Don't know. She could have easily run away with the rest of them. But she stays, magically flips the room upside down when the Salem Seven enter. They all drop onto the swords and die, except the Salem Seven are already dead. So again, that makes absolutely no sense. You can't kill something twice. And the big reveal in this episode, Rio is back because no one bothered asking about why she disappeared during the last trial. And of course, she is not just Rio. She is death. Again, a big reveal that everyone already knew because her action figure packaging announced it when the show first aired. But there you go. The episode ends contrived and meaningless because except for the death of a woman who's already lived for centuries, committing suicide for absolutely no reason whatsoever, that's what we got. Two full episodes of being told what we already know. Two full episodes of exposition, flashbacks, recaps, and info dumps that we already know. Two full episodes of nothing. And we have two more to go for this show to actually find a narrative. Maybe that's what's at the end of The Witch's Road, but I wouldn't hold my breath. And that's what I think. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. As always, thank you for watching. And remember, I'm still your reluctant gringo from somewhere south of the border. Salute and I'll wave off.